Hi, this is Scott Garibay, and today we're going to talk about Dungeons and Dragons, and we're going to talk about Legends of Vox Machina, and I'm going to tell you what the worst moment in Legends of Vox Machina, Amazon Prime, is um, in Legends of Vox Machina, Amazon Prime, Season 1, Episode 2, okay? Um, and, yeah, let's, so, uh, oh, and spoilers for for. Legends of Vox Machina, Amazon Prime, Seasons 1, Season 1, Episode 1 through 6. What was the worst moment in Season 1, Episode 2 of Legends of Vox Machina? Uh, it was a terribly sad moment. It made me sad. I don't think, I think most other people didn't even recognize this moment as anything special. It made me, it made me sad at the moment. I was like, oh. And, like, it makes me, the echo makes me bone achingly sad as I think about it continuously um it, it's really it's painful all right so let, let's get into it all right so what happens um legends of Vox Machina the adventuring crew defeat Brimsythe fantastic uh name for that ancient blue dragon okay they defeat Brinsythe, and they go to Sovereign Uriel. He's the king of Iman, all right, which is an area within Taladore, all right? Um, oh, you know what? Yeah, I think that's the case. I think that's the case. All right, let, let's keep moving here. All right, so um, so basically, they're then they go back to Sovereign Uriel, and they're given their reward for defeating the dragon. And there's this big giant box, and it's shaped exactly the, exactly the size of a chest of gold, right? So, um, Sovereign Uriel comes up and he, and, uh, and, you know, it's a great scene. They, they put the box down and all the members of Vox Machina open up the box and they look inside and there are these, uh, pieces of paper and there's this key, right? And Sovereign Uriel says, these are your honorary titles, right? And he gives them honorary titles of the court. Okay. And he goes, and that is a key to a keep, a keep right here in, um, in Iman, and you're going to be close to, uh, you know, to my court. And the reason why is you guys are protectors of the realm, right? And they're all like, oh, no, where's the gold, right? And I was just like, oh, my gosh, I can't believe this, right? So, one, um, the biggest thing here is the, ca the, the player characters didn't understand that having the favor of the king, right, Sovereign Uriel, and being given their own keep, right, from the king was way was worth way more than gold, right? They're adventurers. They want gold. They can go. They can just go into any bog standard dungeon and pull it out, right? Like gold is not rare or valuable or special, right? But the favor of the king is truly special, right? And if you just stop and think, right, you're going to see that. But what really made me sad? So, and it was saying that you know Grog is not the only Vox Machina character with with an intelligent six. Right, like, so you know, it's just foolishness, right, of, on the part of the player characters. But what was much more bone achingly sad about the whole situation is uh, that story where Vox Machina is given great value and sees something that's worth more than gold as worthless, right, <clears throat> is actually a meta explanation, a meta exclamation from the critical role players from Matthew Mercer, Ashley Johnson, Laura Bailey, Liam O'Brien, uh, Talison jo Jaffe, Sam Rigel, Travis Willingham, from all of them, right, that they actually don't understand real value and value things that are close to worthless as worth more than gold and are being given things that are worth more than gold, but they themselves as people don't put any value on it, right? So let me explain. So I think this whole thing is in the story specific for the following reason, right? It is in the story because subconsciously, I think um, Critical Role had a sense of where they were heading, right? This this thing was launched with with a legit star, Felicia Day, right? Not not a voice actor, like a real Hollywood star, right? And so they knew that they're like we're connected to Hollywood. Dungeons and Dragons doesn't have a mainstreamer. We are going to win, right? I think they had an idea of that, right? And I think what they're going to do is like we're going to have a very we're going to have the most successful D and D stream. I think the Critical Role crew might have had a sense of that when it started, right? 
Uh, but, th but they didn't even know how big that was going to be or what that was going to be worth, right? And so it really is amazing to me just looking at it and seeing the full thing. Just, it's so bone achingly sad. Um, so basically, what is the honorary title for? Oh, and yeah, and today, now, you know, that they have this Amazon Prime success, they still can't see the true value and what their next step should be, okay? So, so basically, what is the honorary title for the actual Critical Role people, right? Well, the biggest thing is that any and all of them can walk into Dungeons & Dragons and say, we want, we want to be a designer or a design lead. For Matthew Mercer, he's actually worthy of being the design lead. He could, he could replace, he, he has the same talent that Gary Gygax had. He had the same talent that John, Jonathan Tweet had. He has the same talent that Rob Hainsu had. He has the same talent that Mike Merle had, right? He could be the design lead, right? And honestly, I, it's, I'm going to say this, that is worth more than gold, right? And the reason why is you're like, a design lead on Dungeons & Dragons? Yeah, right? Okay. Do you know who Jack Kirby is? He's just a comic book writer, but he's legendary, right? Because Marvel is a cultural icon and a global success. And that's exactly where Dungeons and Dragons is going to end up, in my opinion, right? But <clears throat> only people who understand the power of the medium, right, can, of Dungeons and Dragons can get how valuable it is to be the design lead, to be in that chain of design. It's critically important. It goes from Gary Gygax all the way to Mike, uh, Ray Winninger is the main guy now, right? And <clears throat> it's just Ray Winninger replaced uh, Mike Merles. And um, it's it's incredibly important. It's super valuable, right? But Matthew Mercer's like, I don't want that. I, I really hope I get cast in a Netflix series again. Right? Yeah, like, which is... It's bog standard. Like getting another Netflix deal is nothing, right? You you have a chance to be part of history here, right? If you just become another another cog in the Hollywood wheel, you'll get eaten and forgotten. But Dungeons and Dragons is something truly unique, and it's at its inception. It's about to be catapulted into global prominence. I, I'm, you know, but none of the none of the critical role people can see this, right? What is the keep? The keep would be a full fold in, right? The keep would be all of Critical Role going, listen, we've won, right? We we have this Legends of Vox Machina series. Let's, let's uh, you know what? Let's get rid of this ridiculous Critical Role company and let's get rid of Darrington Press and let's go to, uh, uh, and actually we'll have this conversation with Wizards of the Coast first say, we're all in, right? We're going to come in. We're going to do U.S. tours. We're going to show people Dungeons and Dragons all over the country as our show is on Legends of Vox Machina. And we're gonna build, and every single book that comes out is gonna be half Critical Role ideas, half Wizards of the Coast ideas. We're gonna be your employees. We're gonna we're gonna fold Critical Role. We're gonna fold Darrington Press. We're gonna become full full Dungeons and Dragons employees, and we're gonna be at the table when we go to Sony, right, and Disney, and uh, Lionsgate, and every major studio, and say we want five we want five hundred million dollars to start the new D&D series, even before the one right now has even been aired, right? And it's going to be the Dungeons and Dragons critical, it's going to be the Dungeons and Dragons featuring Matthew Mercer, you know, Ashley Johnson, Laura Bailey, all of them as voice actors, as executive producers, not as actors in the movie, right? And we're going to be there when a half a billion dollar uh, launch happens to make Dungeons and Dragons as big as Marvel, to make Dungeons and Dragons as big as Star Wars, because it should be, and to make and to fill the gap of the crumbling Harry Potter series, right? And it could work. It, like if they were, if they just folded themselves in, got rid of the nonsense Critical Role company, got rid of the nonsense Darrington Press company, and those are only nonsense. If you are like, let's be the next full IP. Right? Critical Role is a good company. It's solid, right? Daring to Press is a joke. I don't, I don't think there's anything there. I don't know where to make any real money on that. Um, but Critical Role is real, right? And, but when you look at it in relativeness to what could be accomplished if there's a full fold in of Critical Role directly into official Dungeons and Dragons, and that literally billions of dollars could be on the line if the next fil film series launches and this becomes an IP at the level of Star Trek, Star Wars, um, you know, Fast and Furious, uh, Harry Potter, um, and all of these IPs have major problems now, right? Like, and 
there's a perfect place for D and D to take its crown, right? And Mercer could be in there, but none of them have a clue. Like they, none of them have a clue. They're like, "Oh, our little critical role company, you're doing good with this. We got a Amazon Prime show, right?" They don't see, you know, they're not saying, they're not looking and saying D and D is perfectly poised to be the next MCU, right? Like, and they don't see their part in it, and they they they're looking in the box and they're seeing a piece of paper and they're seeing a key and they're like, "This is worthless," when in reality it's worth far more than gold, and it just makes me sad that they can't see it. It's just it's sad. Well, that's my opinion. What did you think was the saddest moment in Critical Role Season 1, Episode 2? Uh, also, was there anything that you were particularly surprised about in Season 1, Episode 2? Love to hear your thoughts. Let me know in the comments below. Please consider like subscribing and have a wonderful millennium.